Good to see you this morning. Let me take this opportunity to welcome any first-time guest. If you are our guest, we are delighted that you're here. And hopefully, well, yeah. Woo! Amen. And hopefully you received a folder, a welcome packet, and inside that is the card. That if you would just be so kind as to fill that out for us and place that in the offering bag when it comes by, that would help us to stay in touch and to be able to communicate with you. So we are extremely glad that you're here. How many of you are glad that God's here? Amen. Would you help me welcome him to this service? Lord, we are so glad that you are here. We welcome your presence in our lives. We welcome you, Holy Spirit, to take this service in the direction that you would have it to go. This is your time. This is a time that we set aside to come and worship our God in spirit and in truth. So we're asking for the anointing of the Holy Spirit to help us do that so that you would be honored and glorified and exalted and that people would be drawn closer to you as a result. Thank you for this day. Thank you for the privilege of having brothers and sisters in Christ to come together with, to worship with. And I thank you that you're going to do something great today. You're going to change lives. And we just look forward to that in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen and amen. <laughs> Also, as a reminder, be sure you fill out your harvest slips. We'll be praying over those harvest slips in just a few moments. This is our harvest basket. We fill out slips called harvest slips. We place the names of them. All right, y'all going to have to hold it down in the hall. All right. <laughs> I hear way too well. Y'all keep that in mind. The that a lot of things have gone by the wayside, but that one has not. I hear way too well. So I hear conversations, and, and I get distracted. And so don't be talking while I'm preaching either. That just really blows my mind. <laughs> yeah. Unless you're saying amen or, or something of that nature. Because I have this weird thing going on that if I see somebody talking, I think they're talking about something that I've just said or preaching about, and then I start wondering, what did I say that they're talking about? And then I get distracted from what I'm preaching. So don't do that. You owe it to God and to the other people around you. Amen. Oh, <laughs> uh, I will get over it, though. You'd think after 35 years I would be past it already, but anyway. How y'all doing? <laughs> yes. All right. You ready? Brett, you going to do announcements? All right. I'm coming back right after that. What? Thanks for the warning. <laughs> All right. Well, let's find out what's happening at the Praise Center. As many of you know, Faith in Serving Humanity is also known as FISH. This ministry reaches out to the underprivileged children in Walton County every summer through a program called Fish for Kids. This year, Fish for Kids started on May the 19th, and the Praise Center is again providing volunteers to make lunches and deliver them every Tuesday, although you can volunteer any weekday. If you are planning to volunteer or would like to know more, please contact Rick Baker. Uh, Rick is some... I don't see him. He's, he's out serving, but... Everybody knows Rick. If you don't know Rick, just ask somebody, hey, can you point me to Rick Baker, and they'll get you to him. But that's an awesome program to volunteer with for sure. All right, coming up on June the 29th, our children's ministry is hosting Kids Town Family Water Day for the children and their parents. This will be on a Sunday right after the morning service. We'll have a hot dog cookout for lunch and an afternoon of fun and water games for the kids and their families. We promise they will get wet. All right, parents, have your kids invite their friends. All right, attention, men of TPC. Ooh. See, men get excited about eating, and that's what's coming up. There's a men's fellowship steak dinner Friday, June the 27th at 6 p.m. For all the TPC warriors, cost will be $10 per person, and the sign-up sheet is in the foyer. Please see Travis Googe or Phil West. Phil is serving. Anyway, Please see those men if you want more details. All right. Coming up on June the 22nd is Framley Day. <laughs> this is the Sunday to invite as many of your family and friends, coworkers, acquaintances, neighbors, etc., to our wonderful Praise Center. There will be a prize awarded to the person who brings the most guests. 
Now, last week I asked how many of you promised they could invite at least 10 people. How many is still holding true to that? The city of Oakwood and Flowery Branch are coming. <laughs> <laughs> so we have our work cut out for us, Praise Center. Amen. How many believe that God is here? And not because of this building, but because you're here. And so why in the world would we not invite as many people as we possibly can to experience Jesus Christ? Amen? So let's pack the house out. It's going to be a great day. All right. Our youth will be attending summer camp June the 16th through the 20th. This is always a great time, and many of our youth receive salvation. They grow in the relationship with the Lord. They grow deeper with their experience with Jesus. And so we need to do our part, church, to help send them there. The fee is $185 per youth, and several of our, our young guys have a very difficult time coming up with that fee. So if you feel led to help sponsor one or more of them, whether totally or in part, please mark your check accordingly and place it in the offering bag or turn it into the church office as soon as possible. If you have any questions regarding youth camp, please contact Eric or Elsa Nilsson. You guys can now wave. There's Eric and Elsa. They'll be glad to direct you in that ability to sponsor a youth. Amen. All right, this is important. Please mark your calendars. No, really, mark your calendars. <laughs> June the 14th, 9 a.m. in the morning. We need everyone's help, so bring your work gloves, paint brushes, cleaning supplies, hammers, and other tools. As part of Bridging the Gap, our Kids Town TPC is in the process of updating their sanctuary. We've been on the farm long enough, and we're ready to take a trip. All right. See, everybody remembers to do the train sale, but how many people will remember to show up and work? That's why you have to write in your calendar, I will be at the Praise Center 9 o'clock Saturday, June the 14th, to help transform the Children's Church Sanctuary. Counting on you men folks to step up. All right, <laughs> moving right along. <laughs> Foster care and adoption information meeting will be happening Thursday, June the 12th at 7 p.m. in room 207. For more information, please see the lovely Bindi Averett. All right, the pastor's weekly Bible study will resume on Tuesday, August the 12th. The study will focus on the book of Revelation. This study will be held on Tuesdays at 7 p.m. and Wednesdays at 7.30. Please sign up at the hospitality desk as soon as possible so that we can make appropriate preparations for the study guides. There is a $10 per person to cover the study guide cost. It is a 66-week course. So $10 for 66 weeks of material is not too much. Back to you, Pastor. All right. Thank you, Brett. Please do invest in our youth by helping them get to camp and also invest in our children by showing up next Saturday for work day. That would be awesome. I have a couple of things I need to take care of before we begin Whoops, worshiping. Oh, this is going to be good. Yes. I'm glad I got that on the first try. I can hear what you're thinking. Stop it. No. Just kidding. <laughs> Yep, crackle pot. All right. We have a newlyweds among us, Mr. and Mrs. Donald Chamley. Kathy Bank, Blankenship and Donald Chamley got married. Stand up in this. We congratulate them. Woo! Yes. Congratulations. And welcome home, Reverend Hope Brown, from her Yay! journeys to New York. Glad to have you back. And I also want to recognize our newest member to the Praise Center, Bonnie Kermick, is here. If you would come and receive this, she attended our class. Woo! <laughs> All right. All right. God bless you. Welcome to the family. We're so glad you're here. She came last Sunday, stayed for lunch, stayed for class, joined the church, and is back today. So yes! here we go. That's how it's done. All right. Already in the life group, too. That's how you do it right there. Amen.
<laughs> oh my, that's a good thing. God loves cheerful givers. It is time to receive the offerings and the tithes. Bring the tithes in the storehouse. Listen to what God's word says. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing, and your vats will brim over with new wine. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's make our declaration. You ready? I am a worshiper. I was created by God to worship. Therefore, as an act of worship, I bring my tithes and offerings into your storehouse. Based upon your word, I know I will be blessed, although that is not the reason I give. I give with a grateful heart because I love you, and I want to honor you by obeying your word as an expression of my faith. I trust you to open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessings, there will not be enough room for it. I trust you to rebuke the devourer for my sake and to protect my finances. I trust you to honor your word and save my whole family, that they may serve you and walk in health and abundance. And as you bless me, I will bless others and give freely as you direct me. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God.
say we believe. dark, you help us see, Cause there is only one salvation, we believe, we believe, we believe in Jesus Christ, we believe We believe in the crucifixion. We 
word will not return void. It will accomplish what you send it to do today. So I thank you in advance for what you're going to do in and through us as we believe. We believe. We believe what your word says is true. That you're a God who cannot lie. And there's nothing that we face that you can't overcome. And I thank you and praise you for this time. As we worship you in your word. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. And amen. You may be seated. If you have a harvest slip filled out, please hold it up. We'll collect it. We'll pray for our harvest before we get to the word. We want to pray for those who have not yet believed that they will come to that place in their life where they surrender to Jesus. Any others? All right, thank you, Joe and Rick. Praise God. Awesome. God continues to lay on our hearts people that we know that need to come to salvation. So this is not strangers in foreign lands. These are neighbors, friends, family members, co-workers. These are people that we know that need to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen? So join with me in faith. Let's agree together. Father, we thank you for the salvation of every person whose names are on these pieces of paper. That, Lord, you'll do whatever is necessary to draw them by your Holy Spirit to a place where they can call upon the name of the Lord and be saved. Lord, we thank you that you know every individual. You know how they tick. You made them. You know what it will take. You know which approach, which means would, would result in them coming to you. So, Lord, use us however you see fit. We surrender ourselves as a body of believers to be used. When you tell us to speak, we'll speak. When you tell us to go, we'll go. When you tell us to water what someone else has planted, we'll water. We'll encourage. We'll speak life. And you, the Lord of the harvest, will bring forth the increased. And we thank you and we praise you for that. Thank you for these being saved. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, praise God. I've been excited in this series of Matters of the Heart, and if you've not heard the previous ones, they are available. You can go to YouTube, to TPC, or you can go to the TPC, the PrayCenter.net, our website. It'll take you to the YouTube link, and you can see any of the services that we do here. And uh, this is part six in Matters of the Heart. We've learned that God took away our heart of stone and he gave us a new heart. And that heart that he gave us is good. So just turn to your neighbor and say, if you're saved, you've got a good heart. Amen. We also learned that the reason that he gave us these new hearts is because we are to shine. We are to reflect his glory. We are to be his reflections in this earth. And then we learn how that Christ came to heal the brokenhearted. And broken is not just sad. Broken means exactly what it says, broke. And we have a lot of reasons in, in life for our hearts to get broke. But he comes to heal the brokenhearted. Hallelujah. Then we learn how the enemy wants to hinder and harm and ruin God's image bearers. We learn that we're at war, fighting for our hearts. Then we took a look at the process of learning to rule, that we were created by God to rule. He has made us unto himself a kingdom of priests and kings. Priests offer sacrifices, kings rule. And God has ordained that we rule. He gave us back. The second man, Adam, gave us back what the first man, Adam, lost in the garden. We, it's been restored in Christ Jesus, and so our capacity and our ability and our authority to rule has been restored. And therefore, if we are to rule, then that should mean that nothing else is ruling over us. Not life, not circumstances, not the enemy, not our emotions, not the flesh, not anything else should be ruling over us because Jesus has given us authority to rule. Not over people, but over evil. Hallelujah. 
Today, I want us to talk about the treasure that our heart is, the treasures of the kingdom. In Isaiah 60, verses 1 and 2, let's read this together. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. See, darkness covers the earth, and thick darkness is over the people's, but the Lord rises upon you, and his glory appears over you. Hallelujah. Isn't that a great word? I mean, isn't that an awesome word? Your light has come. It's not on the way. It has come. And the glory of the Lord rises upon you. And it talks about the reality of this world. Darkness covers the earth. Thick darkness is over the peoples. But, but the Lord rises upon you. And his glory appears over you. What a great word. God wants us to understand that if our hearts are going to rule, if our hearts are going to bear his image, if our hearts are going to stay good and be all that he's called us to be, that there is a time when there needs to be some recreation. We're not just talking about going to the beach or having fun that could be a very much part of that but there needs to be some recreation and the word re recreation comes from the root word recreate or recreate recre which means to impart fresh life or to make new and God is in the process of always imparting fresh life and he's always in the process of making things new look at that what it says in Isaiah 43 19 says see I am doing a new thing now it springs up do you not perceive it I am making a way in the desert and streams in the wasteland I know just because I'm your pastor and I know just because I'm a human being living in this earth too that there are some desert times there are some dry times there are some times of struggle there are some times of of trying to just make it and here is some good news. Jesus, or, or the Word, the Holy Spirit inspired Isaiah the prophet to write, look, I'm doing a new thing, and I am making a way in the desert. I'm making a way in the dry places. I'm making a way for you to come through to the other side. He didn't say there wouldn't be dry places. He didn't say there wouldn't be struggles. He didn't say there wouldn't be hard times. But he said, listen to me. I'm making a way through it. I'm making a way in their desert and streams in the wasteland. Wastelands are normally wastelands because they don't have any life. They don't have any stream. They don't have any life-giving flow. But he said, look, I am making a way in the desert and streams in the wasteland. And those wastelands are going to become alive again. This isn't even part of the message that God's given me to preach, but it's for somebody here. You're in a wasteland, but God is giving you a new stream in the middle of that wasteland, and you're going to come out of that wasteland better off than before you even went into the wasteland. Hallelujah. Now, Proverbs 4, 23 is a great verse that we need to get a hold of. Above all else, everybody just say, above all else, Guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. All right, let's just read that together in unison. Above all else, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. That's a command from God's Word. We're talking about matters of the heart, that the heart is the treasure where God deposits life. And every good thing and every precious gift that descends from above, it's the heart. So when the word says, above all else, guard your heart, we usually hear that with a sense of keep, keep your eye on that heart of yours just like a lawman would watch over some da dangerous criminal. You better guard your heart. That's how I grew up here in that verse. You better guard your heart. But I want to suggest a different approach this morning. Not don't let that thing out of your sight. We've believed way too long that our hearts are evil. 
I grew up hearing about how desperately wicked our heart is. Anybody besides me ever hear that? Your heart is desperately wicked and no man knoweth it. That is the word, that is scripture, but it's prior to salvation. God has taken that heart out and put a new heart in, and the new heart is good. And we believe for so long that our hearts are evil that we assume that the warning is to keep us out of trouble. So we lock up our hearts and we throw away the key and then we go on and try to live our lives. It doesn't say guard your heart because your heart is evil. It's guard your heart because it is the wellspring of life. It's out of your heart that life flows. So guard it. It's a treasure and everything depends on it. In other words, guard it. Don't let anything distract it. Don't let anything get to it. Don't let anything take it away. Don't let the enemy rob you of what God has put in your heart. Through life, through experiences, through circumstances, through whatever, don't let it rob. That's what it's talking about. Guard your heart. Guard the treasure. Just like if you entrusted your children to someone and say, please watch them while I'm away. That's my most precious treasure. That's what God's talking about here. He said, guard your heart. Don't let the enemy have access to it. Don't let the world distract you from where I've called you to be and called you to do. Hallelujah. Above all else, it says. Above all else. So the question this morning is, what have you done lately to take care of your heart? John Eldridge says, God intends that we treat our hearts as the treasures of the kingdom, ransomed at tremendous cost as if they really do matter and matter deeply. Your heart really does matter, and it matters deeply. It's out of that heart that life flows. It's out of that heart that rivers of living water flow that we'll, we'll see in just a moment in his word. So let's talk about storing up to overflow. Storing up to overflow. How many of you know that there is a difference between a reservoir and a canal? There's a difference between a reservoir and a canal. Now when we're talking about reservoirs, we're not talking about dead seas where nothing is flowing and where there's no life. Lake Lanier is a reservoir. Most of you are familiar with that. It's, it's a giant reservoir, 680 miles of shoreline. Big body of water. Very deep. But it's life because it's not stagnant. It's not dead. It's alive because the rivers flow into it and it flows out. They control the flow out, but it's not a canal. It is a reservoir. And through that reservoir, much life is preserved. Drinking water, electricity, all kinds of things come from that body of water that is a reservoir. Canals run dry very quickly. Shortly after the rain stops, they begin to recede. And they begin to dry up. But reservoirs are a vast and deep reserve of life. And God is calling us to live in such a way that we store up reserves in our hearts and then offer life from a place of abundance. Amen? Listen to what Matthew 13, 52 says. He said to them, Therefore, every teacher of the law who has been instructed about the kingdom of heaven is like the owner of a house who brings out of his storeroom new treasures as well as old. Our hearts are the storerooms of God's treasures. Our hearts are the storeroom of God's blessings and, and life. Everything that God has comes into our spirit, into our heart. And it's from there, listen to Luke 6, 45. The good man brings good things out of the good stored up, where? In his heart. The evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. Now, now watch this last part. For out of the overflow of his heart, his mouth speaks. In other words, your mouth is the spokesman for your heart. 
That could be great news or that could be bad news. Your mouth is the spokesman for your heart. So if your heart is full of God, if your heart is full of the Holy Spirit, if your heart is full of the fruit of the Spirit as produced in you, if your heart is full of the Word of God, if your heart is full of the presence of God, then your mouth is going to speak the presence of God. Your mouth is going to speak the fruit of the Spirit. Your mouth is going to speak the things of God. You're going to bring life. Out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth's going to speak. But if your heart is full of chaos and trouble and fear, and doubt and unbelief your mouth is going to speak that so what we really need is a heart transplant amen some people do especially if you listen to what they're saying their mouth is the spokesperson for their or the spokesman for their heart and if all they're speaking is doubt and unbelief and negativity in fear, then you have to understand there's something wrong inside. If all they speak is trouble, if all they speak is difficulty, if all they speak is bad, if everything they say is not life but death, then that means that they're speaking out of the abundance of what's inside their heart. God wants to deposit good in your heart. Good comes from his word. Good comes from his presence. Good comes from being together in worship together. Good fills our heart. That's why we come to church. We come to church to stay in his presence and bask in his presence and allow his presence to fill us, to get fed on the word of God so that we're equipped to do the work of the ministry. The good things of God are deposited in our hearts so that when we go out of here, we have something to say. That's why he tells us, above all else, guard your heart. Because out of it is the issues of life. Amen? Sometimes we live spiritually the same way we do financially. We get a little bit and spend it. We live like canals. People burn out. Because they're running on empty. They haven't, you can't give and give and give and give and never get. The enemy will get you so busy and so, so stressed out and so burned out that you don't have anything left to give. And you remember last week we talked about abiding, remaining in the vine because the branch cannot produce anything of its own. It only produces as it's connected to the vine which is another way of saying guard your heart. Just like the love languages that we've taught around here for several times, it may be time to do that again. We've taught those love languages and how that if you're married, you have to learn the language of your spouse and speak that into their life because if you don't fill their tank, they'll be running on empty and won't have anything to pour back into you. And so if you're not happy with how they're treating you, then start filling their tank. Why do I have to be the one? I want them to do it nice to me. They can if they're on empty. They don't have anything to give. If all you do is nag and speak death and speak death and speak death, then what do you think you're going to get back? Start speaking life into them. Start filling their tank. Learn their language and speak it fluently. So that their tank is full, then they have something to pour back into you. My, my grandparents were absolutely amazing. Married for 70-something years. I can't remember the exact number. Even got a letter from the President of the United States congratulating them, I think, on their 70th anniversary or something. It was just incredible. But they lived in such a way that they were the example of Ephesians. I mean, they were the living picture to all of us growing up. of Ephesians. She loved Papa as Christ loved the church. I mean, or, or she submitted unto Papa as, as she went unto the Lord. And Papa loved her just like Jesus loved the church. And they outdid each other. I mean, they just outdid each other trying to live that out every day. They never spoke death. 
They always spoke life. And they lived it out in front of us in such an incredible way that we got to see a picture of what Ephesians is supposed to look like in reality. She honored him as her husband. And he didn't take advantage of that and become a dictator and become a boss hog or nothing. He worshipped the ground she walked on. And he was doing gentleman things when gentleman things had no longer stayed popular. She never opened the door for herself, ever. He was the gentleman and cherished her and showed her love. And what did she show back? Love. I mean, it was an incredible picture. And that's the way God wants us to do. He wants us to learn how to love and pour into others' lives so that they have something to pour out to. But if you're own empty, you don't have anything to give. And I don't have time to teach this love language thing here. But let me just help you understand, real quickly, 99 out of 100 times, your love language is nothing like your spouse's. And so if you try to speak your language to your spouse, they're still going to be empty. you got to learn their language and speak it. How many of you know it's hard to learn a foreign language? I had two days of Spanish. Buenos dias, estoy bien, gracias. Que viva Cristo. And that's it. And I learned que viva Cristo on a missions trip in Mexico. All I learned in those two days was buenos dias, estoy bien, gracias. And I had a Spanish teacher that after the first day said no one will ever speak English in this class first day I'm like how am I going to ask you a question no comprende so I lasted two days I didn't understand no English I need that no English You don't learn how to ask a question in one day. I don't think she made it the next year. But Anyway, the point was, it's difficult to learn a foreign language, especially if you have a moron teacher. <laughs> but it's worth the effort. And I want to say this, and then we're going to move on because this is not for today's sermon. If your spouse is trying to learn that foreign language, don't make fun of them. When they don't say it exactly right, it's foreign. And they might mispronounce some of it. And they may stumble over some of it. Encourage them. Don't put them down. They'll quit trying. They'll be out in two days. <laughs> you got to encourage them. Amen. All right. Here's the deal. God's Word doesn't say out of the emptiness of our hearts the mouth speaks, but out of the abundance of overflow. So we must guard our hearts. We must guard them as an act of love. We must guard our, hacks, our hearts as an act of love. It isn't selfish. It's how we begin to love. We care for our hearts for the sake of others. You can't minister to others out of an empty heart. Mark 12, 30 and 31 says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. And the second is like this, Love your neighbor as yourself. There's no commandment greater than these. So here's the thing. If you mishandle your own heart, you'll mishandle others as well. They will see how you handle your heart, and they won't trust you to handle theirs if you're not handling yours. Now, there is a place for sacrifice. Much of Christianity is sacrificial. There's a place. I'm not talking about just guarding my heart and you're just on your own. You got to take care of me. 
No, there is a place for sacrifice, and there has been a lot of selfish things done under the excuse of, oh, I'm just taking care of my heart. People have justified divorce and many other things that way. But the fact that someone abuses an idea does not make it a bad idea. People abuse grace, but that doesn't mean grace isn't true. Amen? People overeat, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't be able to enjoy eating. Don't let others' bad choices shape your life. Guard your heart. Care for your heart. Do it in order to love better. Make sure you guard your heart and keep it full so that you can love the way God commanded us to love. Other people need you. And then do it as an act of devotion. Not only as an act of love, but as an act of devotion. You can't cut off your heart and expect to hear from God. Your heart is where the abundant life that Jesus promised flows into. If you shut down and shut off and push God back, you're not going to hear anything of life flow coming in. He will honor you. He'll honor your request. Don't speak to me. Okay. But blessed are those who hunger and thirst. Blessed are those who seek after God for they will find him. Hallelujah. John 7, 37, 38, Jesus stands up and on that last and great day says in a loud voice, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Anyone. Anyone who is dry, anyone who is empty, anyone who doesn't have what they need, come to me, I'll fill them up. Whoever believes in me, as the Scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within him. Wow. Streams of living water, not toxic poison. The power of death and life is in the tongue. You can either bring life or death. But if your heart is full of God, if your heart is full of life, then you're going to be speaking out of that abundance. And when you speak, it's going to be creative. When you speak, it's going to be life creative. When you speak, it's going to be life giving. Interesting in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost, they were gathered there in obedience to Jesus Christ to go and wait for the promise of the Father. And in Acts chapter 2 and verse 4, it says, All of them, there's 120 of them, all 120 were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now notice what happens. They were filled and spoke. They were filled and began to speak. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. They were so abundantly filled that they couldn't help but speak. And what did they speak? You can find that in Acts chapter 2. They heard them speak the marvelous works of God. God filled them with himself. They were filled with God. They were filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak out of that abundant filling the marvelous works of God. And the people heard them speaking in their own dialect said, how can this be? And Peter, the chicken before Pentecost, stood up and said, these men are not drunk like you suppose. Amen. They have had a transforming experience. By the way, today is Pentecost Sunday worldwide, and we're celebrating Pentecost. For those of you who don't understand what Pentecost is, on the day of Pentecost is when they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Therefore, they became Pentecostal. And Pentecostalism is not a branch of the church. It is the root of the church. The church was born on the day of Pentecost. Every believer should be Pentecostal. Ephesians says, Be ye filled with the Holy Spirit. That's to all of us. 
not for the charismatic or the full gospels or the Pentecostals or the assemblies of God or church of God or all the other brands. Every believer is commanded by God to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you will begin to speak spirit. If you have not guarded your heart and you're filled with everything else, it's going to come out. It's out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. So if your heart is filled with chaos and trouble and turmoil and all the, that's what you're going to be speaking. Now that's not to say that life doesn't throw us curveballs or life doesn't throw us chaos or life doesn't throw us sorrow or trouble, but you don't have to speak all that. You are filled with God. You can speak life into the situation. You can speak life and peace and joy and comfort and love and mercy and all the things of God into the situation. Yes, the situation may be bad. Yes, it may be difficult, but you have someone who is in you greater than whatever's going on in that situation, and you can speak into it. Out of the abundance of your heart, you speak. Hallelujah. God wants to pour into you. Your part is to keep the channel open by caring for your heart. Let me ask you, what does your heart need? What does your heart need today? Does it need rest? Does it need beauty? Does it need music? Do you need some recreation? What makes you come alive? What makes you sing? Is it a sunset? Is it the waves on the beach? What is it? Where do you come alive? Treat yourself. I'm giving you permission to treat yourself to something that would bring life into your heart. Do it for your sake. Do it for others' sake. You need to be filled up. Not only as an act of love and devotion, but also as an act of war. 2 Corinthians 3, or 10, 3 through 5, says, For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. That's an act of war. Taking care of your heart is the first blow against the enemy's schemes. Because if your heart is weak, you're vulnerable. Hyenas cannot bring down a lion in its prime, so they run it and wear it down and taunt it until the point of exhaustion, and then they move in for the kill. That's exactly what Satan's wanting to do. He's wanting through busyness and drivenness to wear us down to get us so vulnerable and to get us so weak the scheme is to keep us running so we don't have time to take care of our hearts his motto is we'll burn them out and then take them out guard your heart above all else guard your heart Above everything else, guard your heart. Not because it's evil, but because it's good. And you need to guard it and not let the enemy take it. And not let, let the enemy steal and rob and destroy anything that God's deposited in there. How many of you know he will try to take your faith? Don't let him. Guard it. He'll try to take your joy. Don't let him. Guard it. He'll try to steal your peace. Don't let him. Guard your heart. Your heart is where peace abides. Your heart is where faith abides. Your heart is where life abides. 
I don't want to be taken out. And I don't want to see any of you taken out. Why? Because others are counting on us. We must take care of our hearts. That's the first line of defense because an empty heart is vulnerable to temptation. This is the last thing the enemy wants you to know. His plan from the beginning is to assault your heart, just as the wicked witch did to the ten woodmen. Make them so busy they ignore their heart. Wound them so deeply they don't want a heart anymore. Twist their theology so they despise their heart. Take away their courage. Destroy their creativity. Make intimacy with God impossible for them. Of course your heart would be the object of a great and fierce battle. It's your most precious possession. Listen, without your heart you can't have God. Without your heart you can't have love. Without your heart you can't have faith. Without your heart you cannot find the work that you were meant to do. In other words, without your heart you cannot have life. Guard it. Guard it. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes for a moment? And let's pray together. Lord, you taught us how to pray. Part of the prayer that you taught us was to lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Lord, we repent of being so busy that we've left our hearts dry and empty. Lord, we ask for forgiveness and we ask for deep, deep restoration today. Lord, I'm asking for myself and for everyone else that you would fill us, fill us, fill us to overflowing. Fill us fresh. Fill our hearts so that out of the abundance of that filling, we would be speaking life. There's so many depending on us, God. There's so many that need to hear from you, that need your peace, your joy, your life, your forgiveness, your restoration, your mercy, your grace. Fill us, God. We repent of running on empty way too long. And we're asking now for forgiveness and restoration. Fill us in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. The worship team is going to lead us. And I just believe that God would honor his word this morning. And I just believe that if you have a small amount of faith, even as small as a grain of mustard seed, you would just step out in that faith and say, God, I'm empty. I really am. And I need to be filled. I need to be refilled. Whatever the case may be. I believe if you'd step out in that act of faith this morning, that God will meet you here. God will meet you right here at this altar, and I believe that we can leave out of this place today filled with God. Filled with His Holy Spirit. Filled to abundance so that out of that abundance our mouth can speak things of God. Speak life. As they sing, you respond accordingly to the Holy Spirit. Let's stand with this place.
Accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. A couple of days ago in the beauty parlor, she accepted Jesus Christ. Welcome to the household of God. I bless you. Welcome to the family. Amen. God is good. And all the time. Amen. Amen. Take the light and shine. Go shine in this world this week. Amen. God bless you.